Listen, I've been in a series where we've been talking about the works of the flesh, and I'm moving on from that today, and we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit we're going to start with is the first one it mentions, which is love. And so we're going to talk about that. But our text has been Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. And if you come every week, you should get this down. You should be like thinking about this in your sleep when you wake up. Like, why am I thinking about this scripture? Because you're hearing it all the time. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24 reads, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Once again, walking in the Spirit is walking according to the Word of God, not walking according to the twilight zone. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And these aren't all of them, but these are a lot of them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. And again, when we talk about fornication, that's any sex outside of marriage. So if you're not married under the you know, eyes of God, if you haven't been married officially, that's fornication. It doesn't matter what kind of sex it is. Homosexual sex is included in that. If you, I love him, I love her, and you live together and you're not married, that's fornication. Amen. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, they, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, or faithfulness, meekness, teachable, temperance, against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So when it talks about they which do such things in Galatians 5.21, we're going to back up here, of the which I tell you before, Paul writes, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The word do is the Greek word praso or preso. It means to practice. It's a person who performs these things as a matter of routine. Their actions or these actions are her or his norm. It's their habit. It's what they do constantly and consistently. So he's saying if you're working in the works of the flesh and if you do, in other words, this is your pattern of life, this is your routine, this is your... Um, this is what you do consistently, this is what you do habitually, it's your norm, it's the way you live life. He says you cannot go to heaven and you will not go to heaven. Now, if you mess up once in a while, that's different than doing it being your norm, being your habit. And so we all sin and come short of the glory of God. So you can maybe do some of those things, but if that's your norm, if that's your routine, if that's the thing you consistently do, he said, understand this, you will not go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven. Now, if you were here or wasn't here or haven't been here, as I've gone over every work of the flesh, you can go back on our website and our podcast or download our app. We have a, a legacy app. You can download that and get on it and listen to all those sermons. But, but I, I thought I'd bring that back out because it's not like, oh, you did this, you're going to hell. No, if that's your habit, if you habitually fornicate, if you habitually are envious or jealous. If you habitually stay in witchcraft, and witchcraft, and I taught on it, has a lot to do or some to do with your horoscope. If that's your habit, you got to stop it. The psychic channels, stop it. The mediums, stop it. Are you hearing me? The curanderos, stop it. We, we need to understand that's witchcraft, that's stuff. I don't care if they say it's white witchcraft or whatever, dark or whatever. They, it's all bad. Amen. <sighs> so those who practice these things, who habitually do these things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the Apostle Paul. That's not Steve or Legacy Church. People constantly, I hear them say, uh, you know, well, Legacy Church teaches that. Well, if we teach it because the Bible says it. What is your issue? I mean, either you like the Bible or you don't. Either you agree with it or you don't. Either you're willing to learn it or you're not. So when people say, well, Legacy Church, I'm like, what, what do you think we get it? Just make it up? 
Like I have a meeting before church and say, let's just make up some new stuff. <laughs> and what we need to understand is your eternal life is the most important thing to your life. There is nothing more important than your salvation. And if you make a mistake about your spiritual condition, it is a mistake you will regret for eternity, forever and ever and ever. You do not get do-overs. So we don't want to make a mistake with our spiritual lives. And so what we can and should practice, though, is the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we should practice. That's what we should get good at. You can't practice it enough. You can't have enough of it. And we need to understand that the Apostle Paul, he used the word fruit because fruit is wonderful. Come on, good fruit is... And it's healthy and it's beneficial. He could say the vegetable of the Spirit. So when he was saying fruit, he was saying, he was saying this stuff is wonderful, it's healthy, it's beneficial to you. I remember one time I went to South Carolina to preach for a guy, and, and we went to his house or his condo, and, and him and his wife had these peaches. They were like incredible peaches. I took, I said, can I have one of those? And they said, sure, because I love peaches. I took a bite, it was so juicy, I literally went outside his door by his flower bed thing and ate it over there because when I took a bite, it was just like everywhere. It was so good when I got done with that one, I said, can I have another one? I'm already messed up. So I'm literally eating it like this because it's just going everywhere. Now, you know, that's good fruit. And that's how we need to practice this fruit. Like it's so delicious. It's so wonderful. It'll help us so much. That's why the Apostle Paul says fruit of the Spirit. It's healthy. It's wonderful. It's beneficial. But the moment you receive Jesus as your Savior, God sowed his Spirit. He put his Spirit into your heart like a seed. And you were spiritually born again by the incorruptible or uncorruptible seed of the Word of God. 1 Peter 1.23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, when he talks about seed, it is the Greek word sperma, where we get our word sperm. And so what God is saying, when you're born again from his spirit, he puts his DNA in you. Just like the father and the mother, you get, you know, the seed from the dad, his portion. We got God's portion in us. And it, but it's incorruptible. It's uncor It can't be corrupted. It is incredible, and he puts it in us. And, and that should even give us a desire to want to embrace and practice and, and get better at walking in the fruit of the Spirit. And it should com compel us to move away from the works of the flesh. That's why, once again, if you get born again tonight and go do something you normally do, but you have truly been born again, and you go out and do what's normal to you, and you feel bad about it, that's because now you have the incorruptible seed in you. But if you can go do whatever you want to do and don't feel bad, that seed was never placed in you. Well, how do I know? You know by that. Can you continue to live in sin without ever feeling bad? See, the Bible says, and some Christian will tell me, oh, man, there's no condemnation. I'm not talking about being condemned. I'm talking about feeling some remorse. The Bible does say godly sorrow leadeth to repentance. I'm not talking about being beat up every day of your life, feeling like you're nothing. I'm talking about, I blew it, man. I made a mistake. I feel bad about it. That's how you know. And if you never experienced that, that remorse, that godly sorrow, that thought that, man, I shouldn't have done that, I wish I hadn't, then you need to question whether you've ever been born again. Because we get deceived and we have been deceived to think that you just say a prayer and, you, and you're good at it. But, but God knows your heart. If you're, not, if you're not sincere and following him, 
Well, I'll get saved because she wants me to. Or I'll get saved because he wants me to. And then nothing ever changes. It's because you haven't given God your heart. We make salvation so cheap. And it's not hard, but you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and realize now I need to start learning the practices of the word to follow the word because now, and now I have a desire to because I have this incorruptible seed that's been placed in me. And you got to remember, whatever seed is sown, that's what it produces. Apples produce apples always. And oranges always produce oranges. And so God's seed inside you immediately begins to produce God in you. And so when people say, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, and they don't have any action to show that, then the point is they have mentally assented. They agree that Jesus is Lord, but he's not Lord of their life. So we should expect our lives to produce more and more of the fruit of the Spirit and less and less of the works of the flesh if we've been truly born again. And folks, this has perplexed me for many years, just so you know. Because I would talk and I'd say, man, when I do something wrong, I feel awful. I've made so many mistakes, and I feel bad. To this day, some of them I feel bad. Sometimes I'll be reminded for some other reason of something I did even before I got saved, and I'll feel bad. Some of our folks in our church that I've known since junior high school, they went to a funeral, and, and the guy told me what funeral he's going to, and I said, is that so-and-so? And he said, yeah. And I said, please tell that person that I'm sorry for the way I acted when I was in high school towards that person. And so he did. And I was sincere because I felt, I said, oh, my goodness. Wow. I wasn't very nice. I didn't treat that person very well. And so he went and told her. He said, hey, he said this. And I, I liked the response I got back. He said, they said, listen, we were all young and we were all stupid, so I'm good. But see, that's, the heart, that's how you know. So when you, when, you're, when you make a mistake and you feel bad about it, that's how you know you're God's child. That, you should rejoice and like, thank you, Lord, you still love me enough to deal with me. Amen. Not run from it. And that's what people do. People have run from this church. We've talked to them. They have. They, they said, I don't like it because I, I feel so convicted and I don't like feeling that way. Well, that's the only way God can teach you and lead you. And when you run away from God, what do you have left? And so as we talk about that, let's look at the work or the fruit of the Spirit, love. This love that he talks about is agape. Now, there's eros love, which is erotic, romance. Phileo love, which is like brotherly love. And, and, and there's agape love that, that this is talking, referring to. This is one of the most difficult words to translate in the New Testament. It's just tough. And, and I've read so many things that people try to describe it. Rick Renner describes agape. He says it occurs when an individual sees, recognizes, understands, or appreciates the value of an object or a person causing them to behold this object or person in great esteem, awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. When you have the love of God in you, that's how you see his creation. That's how you view God in awe, admiration, wonder, and sincere appreciation. This love for this person or object is so strong that it becomes irresistible. And this is the kind of love that God placed in us. This is the fruit of the Spirit, agape love. This is that love that we need to understand what it is. And so I'm going to purpose to define it. When God looked upon the human race, he was in awe of us, mankind, his creation. Even though we were lost to sin, he was still in awe of his creation because God looked and saw his own image in us. When people try to say God's a color, that's just dumb. God's a spirit. There is no color. He made the colors. And they say, oh, he's this color. He's this color. got to be that color. Oh, my goodness. Are you serious? And, and see, we get so natural thinking. 
We were all made of the dust of the earth. And women, you were taken out from us. God made you one step further from the earth, but when we die, we all go back to the dust. And the part that God breathed into us is his image, eternal life, as eternal beings. And we all may be different colors of the earth, but the part that God's in awe about is the part he breathed into mankind and said, this is my greatest creation. And because of that, God looked and loved us regardless of our state. He loved us so much that it drove God to do something to help us. That's what the agape love does. It drives you to do something. So what did he do? He said, Jesus, the Savior of the world, that if you receive him as your Lord and Savior, Lord means he's in charge. You give up your will to his will and say, okay, I know I have this way of thinking, but I'm going to read the word, learn the word, and when I learn it and find it, I'm going to start believing that way. So agape knows no limits or boundaries. How far, wide, high, and deep it will go to show that kind of love. God's love will even sacrifice itself for the object it does love. It is a type of love that moves a person to action to help somebody else, to get involved in the kingdom, to do something. This kind of love has no strings attached, though. It isn't looking for what it can get, but what it what it can give. It will do good regardless of the response. It will do the right thing regardless of how someone else acts. So some people say, well, I did this for them. They didn't even say thank you. The agape kind of love doesn't care about saying thank you. It's nice to appreciate what someone does for you, but if they don't, we didn't do it for that. You hear Christians or people that call themselves Christians all the time, that will say things like, they just don't appreciate what I do. Just because we don't say it every day don't mean we don't appreciate it or someone doesn't appreciate it. This kind of love begins to grow and develop where if someone does respond and says, thank you so much, I appreciate it, we're good. But if they don't, we're still good because we don't do things for that response. Well, this person acts this way and he makes me crazy, she makes me crazy, so I act like this. See, the agape kind of love doesn't respond that way. It says, I'm going to do the right thing regardless of what anybody else does. This is the kind of love we need to grow in. Is it hard? Yeah, man, because we have feelings and emotions. And this is what God's word is trying to teach us. God, see, God loved us even when we were lost to sin. And regardless of how we acted or responded to him, he still loves us. When you walk in the fruit of the Spirit love, you realize it's a choice, and this is huge, and not a feeling. We all think this love, this agape love, is a feeling or an emotion. Now, we do love some things with feeling and emotion. But it's really greater than that. It's a choice. I choose to love God. I choose to do what he asks. I choose because he said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. I choose to love this person. It doesn't mean they got to be your best friend or whatever, but I choose to forgive them, not based on how I feel because it's the right thing to do. I choose not to get offended. Why? Because offense is a feeling, is an emotion. You feel slighted. Excuse me, I'm spitting everywhere, but this kind of, this kind of love does not feel slighted. It doesn't do it for that. It does it because it's the right thing to do. The kind of love, this kind of love won't allow you to stay hurt, to continue to have hurt feelings. Now, I'm going to say this. that The best of us will get hurt and have hurt feelings. You, you, you can't avoid that. But the agape kind of love, as you grow in it, won't let you stay there. It won't let those things fester. It won't let them just grow into bitterness. It'll move beyond them and say, yeah, I got hurt, and I'm going to pick myself up. I'm going to clean myself off. I'm going to dust myself off, and I'm going to move forward. That's what this love does when you grow in it. So when you get around people that their feelings get hurt all the time, they're just not mature in this agape love, the fruit of the Spirit, so they got to grow in it. So I'd be remiss if I ever said your feelings will never get hurt. They will get hurt. But what are you going to do with them? You're going to stay hurt 
Are you going to pick yourself up and move beyond that? And say, nope, God, I'm not going to be moved by that. I'm going to do the right thing regardless of how I'm feeling today. It makes a choice to let things go, regardless of what someone else does or does not do. Well, I went up and apologized to this person, and you know what? They had the audacity. They never even apologized back. Well, so what? You're, you're going to be accountable for what you do. God's going to bless you for what you do. And so just because you apologize, you expect someone else to say, yeah, I did it wrong. And they may look at you like, I did nothing wrong. And you're like, you did it all wrong. I'm apologizing for something I didn't even do. But this kind of love doesn't care if they respond or not. They're just going to continue to do the right kind of thing. This is the agape kind of love that Paul says we should walk in the fruit of the Spirit. 1 John 3.18 says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So when people say they love God and they love Jesus, but they never do anything, then the Bible clearly says, don't you do that. Don't love that way, because that ain't love at all. Amen. Actions speak louder than words. You ever heard that? The Bible's saying it right here. But you're to love them in deed and in truth. I love the church, but I never show up. I love the church, but I put everything first. I love God, but I, but I, but I, I get so inconvenienced with him, so I just do my thing, but I love him. Uh -oh. See, the Bible says don't. <laughs> yeah, uh oh, it's right. The Bible says... The Bible says that's not the way you love God. You don't love God in word and talk. Saying it doesn't make it so. It's your deeds, it's your actions, it's the truth you walk in. Amen. So many say they love God, but there is no deed attached to it. That's why when you saw the video of, you know, fixing up those houses, Habitat for Humanity, for Habitat for Humanity, that we're saying, you got to go do something. Those people, just to tell someone you love them and walk away and leave them hungry doesn't, doesn't mean you love them, but we're actually going to help people get into homes. Now, we can't do a, a bunch of homes a year, but we can do at least one. When we give that money to Make-A-Wish at the end of the year, when we give money to Operation Smile, that's the deed. When you get involved in the church, that's the deed. Now I love God. Now I'm invested. And whatever you're invested in, that's, what you, that's where your heart will be. But if you don't invest in the kingdom, if you don't serve, do something, give something, then you're not invested. That's why it's easy for those people to walk away whenever they get their feelings a little hurt and think they're so spiritual, but, they, but they're not. They're immature. First Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, follow after charity in the King James means love. It's, a, it's agape kind of love. And desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. The word follow here means to hotly pursue. It's like a hunter going after, you know, tracking down an animal to shoot, to kill. He, and, and, and even sometimes once they shoot him, the animal will run off, and then they have to hotly pursue that animal to find it so it's not, you know, it's not just out there rotting or, or, or you know, just laying there hurt that you can you can, you know, I was going to say finish him off, but you, you, can, you can take him out of his pain and misery. You don't want him to suffer. I, I know, I know. But what I'm saying is that's what that means. We're to, we're to pursue, hotly pursue this agape kind of love. We're to pursue it. So that means you got to pursue God. you got to learn his way. you got to get more proficient or efficient in walking in this kind of love so your little feelings don't get hurt. And I'm not minimizing feelings because we all have them. What I'm saying is we have to, as believers, followers, Christ followers, have to grow in this because somebody in this church is going to rub you wrong, say something wrong, act a certain way, cut you off in the parking lot. And some of us that just live by our feelings will say, that's how those Christians act. Are you serious? That's how everybody acts. But we can't be moved by all that. Amen. See, this should be our focus, to pursue God and the fruit of the Spirit love. John 13, 35 says, by this, shall, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another or for one another. Folks, that means that we forgive quickly. We don't stay offended. 
I mean, some people are just waiting to be offended. They're just waiting to hear something. So they can be offended and all hurt because they don't agree with truth. They, they, they put their family members or children above the Word of God, and every time the Word of God begins to speak against something a family member is doing or living or a child the way they're doing or living, then we get all hurt because we just don't want to accept the truth. And Jesus said, you got to put me before all that. I mean, God is so smart. He put in here what we needed to follow him. He knew there was going to be a day and age, probably back then as well as here, where we'd put our children before what's right, before the word of God. And we, we have to understand that to walk in the love of God means that we're going to be honest with people. Not harsh, not wagging our finger, but honest. It's the love of God that will tell people, regardless of what you'll be called, that certain lifestyles are not right. And it, it's appalling to me. I mean, there's a guy running for president that is married to a man. And he says, you'll have to take it up with my maker. Talking about God, the God that we serve. Because somehow God is so ignorant and stupid he makes mistakes. Did you know that? And see, we don't think like this because we're so inundated to the culture and what's popular today. And my thought is, are you serious? You're blaspheming God. You're saying that God made a mistake, that you weren't supposed to be a man, you were supposed to be a woman. And somehow God didn't see that. Oop, my bad. Instead of John, that should have been Josephine. Jesus, we blew that one, dude. I mean, come on. And people are buying into this. They tried to find the chromosome, or they did genome studies, and they did studies, and couldn't find anything that linked this. But now, so now, it's this the way God made me. That's blaspheming God. You're, what you're saying is God is small and ignorant and stupid, and that he makes mistakes with people. It's not our mistake. It's not our deal to deal with, to, to use self-control and to work through things and feelings and emotions. It's God's fault. But see, we don't want to hear this at times. Last night I brought this up and someone got up and left. I'm like, I'm looking like, wow, it does work like that. You get a little offended because of the truth. Now, this is the Bible. I'm not making this stuff up. And it's not to hurt people, it's to help them. And anybody in here that's fighting that, if you come to our staff, if you come to our, we have licensed clinical therapists on staff. If you come, they'll help you walk that out so you can get free and delivered, so you can go to heaven and not hell. I, what I'm saying is we'll help anybody. We'll help anybody. But this is how people will know us, by the way we treat people, the way we treat others. And we don't have to deceive or lie to them because we're concerned that they'll call us a name. The God kind of love is not based on affection. A lot of things we love are based on affection, but his love is based on a deliberate choice. And this agape kind of love, we have to choose to walk in regardless of who we're dealing with. And if it's impossible at all, we are to try to live at peace with others. So we have to do everything we can. What's possible here? We have to put away our differences, our hurt feelings, and just say, this is how I choose to live because this is how the world is going to know who I belong to. That's how they're going to see the difference. Man, I know this person did you wrong at work, but man, you just got over it and you're actually cordial to them and nice to them. Say, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm not going to be moved by that. I'm going to do what I know to do, and God's the one that ultimately blesses me. So this means we don't get offended or stay offended. Some of you are so tempted to get, I mean, that's your temptation is to get offended, but you don't stay there. You say, nope, 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 I'm not going to stay offended. I'm not going to stay that way. Man, when they said that, that hurt me, but I'm not going to stay hurt. I'm going to work through that. I'm not going to let that hurt or offense fester in me because it'll only work to destroy your life while everybody else goes and lives theirs. So we're pretty, it, it doesn't take any work to walk in the f works of the flesh. 
We're born to do that. But you're born again to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And But we have to practice it. What does that mean? That means God's going to avail you to some circumstances to practice it. And you're going to get to practice and practice. People say, don't pray for patience because then you'll need it. No, you need patience anyway. You don't have to pray for it. It's going to knock on your door. We forgive quickly. Why? Because it is not based on what anyone else does or doesn't do. It's based on what I choose to do. This kind of love wants what is best for the other person as well. We don't want people to fall. We don't want people to fall and be destroyed. We want what's best for them. And one of the reasons people choose not to walk in this kind of love, here's the kicker, is because they don't believe it works. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. Love never loses. It never fails. It never loses. But love doesn't mean enabling. That's the opposite of love. Love doesn't mean just to go along to get along either. The God kind of love, the agape kind of love never fails. It never loses. And when you and I believe that, we'll walk more in the the God kind of love, the agape kind of love that we are to walk in the fruit of the Spirit because it's beneficial to us. It's helpful. And when you really get to practice the God kind of love is with your spouse. Because we all know we'll act a way not with our spouse or our family that we would never act in front of strangers. At times people will treat strangers better than they treat their own family. Because we think we can. And we have to learn to walk in this kind of love. And my wife and I have a... a fun in our relationship and she'll do things sometimes but she doesn't mean to do them and then she'll look at me and she said you meant to do that and I said yeah I did she'll say I didn't do it intentionally but you did it intentionally I said yeah I did because I got mad and I said well watch this I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that and, and she I she doesn't think like that but I do and so I blow it in that area because I'm thinking she did that watch what I do and, 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 and I'm just being honest, it's just, it's just the way. so I have to practice not being of that mindset. Are you listening? None of us are perfect. We all have things to work on. But, but the thing is, are you working on them? God chooses to love us, not because we deserve it, because he chose to. None of us can outdo God with, the, with love for humanity. When people say, are you loving like God loves? No, I don't know how to do that. God is God. I'm not. I'm just a work in progress. How many of y'all say you're a work in progress too, right? I... The best we can do is begin to grow in this fruit of love and work at it. Work at not being so moved by our emotions and feelings all the time. Work at it. It's your choice. It's your choice. It's your prerogative to, to, to walk in and say, I know they hurt my feelings, but I'm going I'm to deal with it different today. I know they said this to me, but I'm going to walk in different. And you know what's so funny is, you know, for, I've been married to my wife for over 33 years now, and, and what's interesting is, is that she... <laughs> I actually just forgot what I was going to say. But it, it was going to be a compliment. I did. I'll, I'll remember here in a moment. I got to laughing, and I'm like, what was I going to say? I was going to say it was good. But for 33 years, you know, I've been married to her, and, and, and certain things would happen, and I would do certain things. And I would know her reaction. And she would react in a way that would tick me off or bother me. So she kind of handles all of our money. And so when I'd go spend money, she would like, what did you do this? And why did you do that? And I would just think, I'm going to go spend some more money. <laughs> and so then I would go spend money, and then I would give her the receipt. And then sometimes I'd be waiting like she's going to say, and then she says nothing. And I'm like, that's not fair because I'm, I'm ready. 
It's my money too. I'm going to spend what I want. And then she'll act differently. And I'm like, that is just wrong because I'm all pumped up and ready for her to say something. I'm going to say something. And, and then she's just like, okay, whatever. Thank you for the receipt. And I'm like, who are you? And what did you do with my wife that I've been married to for all this? What the heck is going on here? But people are working on how they deal with stuff. And so now i got to back up and say, now how do I deal with that? That's not what I'm used to. But that's what she's doing. What I'm saying is, guys, is that we all are a work in progress. But are you going to allow the Spirit of God to work in you and through you to grow in some areas and realize that maybe the way you've been doing it is not actually correct? Or maybe i got to change a little of this or change a little of that. And it changes everybody else the way they respond and act. That's how they'll know us, is by our love. Ed Cole said this as I close. When a sinner does not accept God's gift of mercy, then they say, God, I can handle your judgment. And right now on this earth, you can receive the mercy of God. Once you die, there is no mercy. You're either right with him, you've either walked with him, you've either been truly born again by the incorruptible seed or you have not been. And you don't get to make excuses. And God's mercy is being extended to each and every one of us in this room today and whoever's listening on Facebook Live and, and live streaming and at our East Mountain campus. The mercy of God is being extended to everybody. But his mercy is only for the earth, not for heaven. Because once you get to heaven, you're going to be with him. We're going to be with him. We'll be around him. He doesn't need to be merciful because we'll be changed. We won't have this sin nature in us any longer. But if you have walked with God and walked away, then you need to ask yourself, how could you ever walk away? So you must be born again. You must be born of this incorruptible seed that God places in you that gives you a desire uh, sometimes an irresistible desire to know him and to know his ways. Or you're satisfied with, I can handle the judgment of God. And I'm going to tell you this. You, you should never pray for God's justice. It's always his mercy. Because we can't handle the justice of God. If we ever got what we truly deserved, any of us, it wouldn't be good. I don't want what I deserve, God. I want what Jesus paid for me. And if you're here, and you've never truly given God your heart. You say, well, I prayed a prayer. It doesn't work. I've heard that so many times. It hadn't worked because you had no desire to follow him. You wanted to have, you know, hell insurance, fire insurance, but you had no desire to follow him and do what he says and learn his ways. That's why I didn't do anything. God's not selling insurance. He's selling life and eternal life. And if that's you and you say, man, I need his mercy, then you need to get right with him today. You need to receive his mercy that he has for us. We don't deserve it. He's just willing to give it to us. And be born of the incorruptible seed. The Holy Spirit comes living in your heart and begins to change your whole nature. And that happens by you believing in your heart, confessing with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, and having the intention to follow him, to learn his ways. What does the word of God teach? That's what I'm going to start doing. And the first thing you do as a believer, once you become a believer, is you make church a priority. It becomes a priority over everything. And then you get involved. And then you start giving. Because that's your investment. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And the reason a lot of people can come and go from church or this or that is because they've not made the investment so their heart's not even there. So it's easy to walk away from where your heart's not. You can go on a date with somebody and be okay. I liked them. That was okay. But if you never see them again, you're not hurt. But maybe you date that person for a year and you, you, now you're, you're, you're invested. Maybe you paid for their meals. You know, if you're a guy, you take out a girl, you... You open their car door. You, you pay for the movie and all their snacks. And you take them to dinner and you pay for that. 
and you spend time with them. You've made an investment. Now they look at you and say, oh, I'm done with you. Now it hurts. You know why it hurts? Because you've made an investment. If there's no investment, I can walk away from that to bother me. She don't like me. He don't like me. I don't care. I don't have any investment there. But when you invest in the kingdom, that's how you really, you, God gets your heart and you give God your heart. Then it's not so easy to walk away when things don't go your way, you don't get what you want, or you get your little feelings hurt, or whatever it might be. You're like, I'm going to just work through that because I, I made an investment here. I'm, I'm not leaving. And so you have to be willing to make an investment now by giving God your heart with a desire to follow him. Salvation's not cheap. It was paid with a high price. And you have to be willing to say, I don't only want you as my Savior, I want you as my Lord. You get to lead me now. And I know I've got a lot to do. I've got a lot to work on because I said we're all a work in progress. But if you're progressing towards him, then you're working. It's not just talk. It's deed and action. So you get to decide. If you're here today, listen, I'm not going to call you forward when I pray, but I'm going to pray with you at your seat. I'm going to ask you to do something here in a moment. With every head bowed, if you say, Pastor, that's me. I've walked with God. I've walked away. I'm coming home today. I need to be born again of this incorruptible seed. I need to get to a place where you're right. I need to make a real investment. And that means no matter how much life throws at you, you'll stay with it. Or you hear and you say, Pastor, I prayed prayers, but you're right. Never with the thought or intention to actually do what he says or learn about him. I just knew it was the right thing to do. But I'm ready now to give him my heart, really. To believe in my heart and confess in my mouth and say, God, you have permission to put your DNA in me so that I can begin to journey with you, walk with you. If that's you in the powerful name of Jesus, right at your seat, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And this is your way of confessing him, what I'm going to ask you to do. And if one will do it, others will. So if that's you in the powerful name of Jesus, at your seat with every head bowed and you say, Pastor, I'm ready. Would you pray with me in the powerful name of Jesus? Holy Spirit, help us find every one of them. May everyone have the courage just to do what, whatever, whatever we ask and just say, I just want to get right with him. I want to know that I'm right with him. Because you're right. Salvation is the most important thing and I don't want to make a mistake on my spiritual life. If that's you in the powerful name of Jesus, right at your seat, here's what I'm asking you to do. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand right now. I'm going to ask you to stand up. Thank you, guys. Who else would join these? And stand. Just stand on your feet. All over this place. Who else would stand? Thank you. God bless you. Just remain standing. God bless you over here. Thank you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. I'm going to look across the top. Who else would join? This is, this is about your life, your eternal life. I can't save you guys. You can belong to a church all, all your life and still not be right with God. Thank you, ma'am. And no matter who you are, where you come from, you fit here. Everybody fits in the family of God. Everybody has a place to get involved and to help. Anybody else? Let's look around one more time. and look around the top. Anybody else? There's already people standing. You won't be standing alone. You won't be praying alone. We'll all pray together. As I look across the bottom section, it's not far. It's from here to here, inches, that could change your life forever. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I thank you for each one standing today. I thank you their life will never be the same because of your word, your truth, and your ways. That we all realize we're a work in progress. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all down. We just continue to work and get better and grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to grow in love, God. Real love. Not this fake, phony love that we see all the time, but the real love of God. Bless these. And you love these folks. God is how they acted. You can't love them any less or any more than you love them right now. So bless each one in Jesus' name. If you're standing, I want you to pray this prayer loud with me. If you're sitting and you're already right with God, I want you to pray in support of those standing. So if you're standing, you won't be praying alone. We'll all be praying together. Would you guys pray this prayer with me? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe that he is your son. And I choose to believe he is Lord of all. Now, Jesus, be Lord of my life. 
place your incorruptible seed in my heart, in my life, in my mind. And I thank you for saving me today and forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church, if you would.